We just had this song sung, Right to be Wrong. And um, it's uh, written by a girl named Josh Stone uh, from, uh, from England. She, uh, you listen to the words of that song, it's not too uh, hard for us to see why a song like that would just fit into our culture and be so popular. It was written a couple years back, but listen again to the words to this song. It says here, I've got a right to be wrong. I've got to sing my own song. I might be singing out of key, but it sure feels good to me. I've got a right to be wrong, so just leave me alone. I mean, it does speak of this sense of just our, our own independence, right? And how we're just entitled to our own opinions and living our own life. How about the second stanza here? It says, you're entitled to your opinion, but it's really my decision. I can't turn back on, I'm on a mission. If you care, don't you dare blur my vision. Let me be all that I can be. Don't smother me with negativity. Whatever is out there waiting for me, I'm going to willingly, I'm going to face it willingly. You're going to see in a moment, it's such a contrast to um, how God says we're going to get to really know wisdom. A wisdom and discernment that is going to present a message that really can change a person's life. It, it brings a settledness into one's soul that very often, despite our uh, attempts, we, it just leaves us that much more longing. You know, over the past uh, couple of weeks, we have been uh, engaged now in a series uh, from the book of uh, 1 Corinthians. And um, we looked at a particular passage where a number of divisions were arising within this fellowship that met at this church in Corinth. And it began to threaten the very uh, core of this fellowship. Some people were showing an allegiance to Paul, other ones to Apollos, a, a great preacher. You could read about him in the book of Acts. Um, there were those who said, no, I'm more uh, inclined to follow, after, to follow after Peter. But their allegiance soon shifted from this message that these preachers were preaching to the preachers themselves. And then, as a result, the community began to add on to this message because um, it, it appeared to them that uh, the message just couldn't hold up on its own. And so Paul then launches into this whole analysis of how the wisdom of God is so much more superior to the wisdom of the world. Because the world, he says, in its own wisdom, failed to really know him. But God says that in my wisdom that I have given to the world, it comes with a power that enables a person to fully understand all the grace and the, and the, and the righteousness that God has performed, not only in, in his son Jesus, but what he wants to do in our life. And I would contend that as you sit here and, um, and you think about your life and decisions that you make on an ongoing basis, there are, there are those moments that you are looking for peace in the midst of a storm. There are, there are times when you want to be able to make a little bit more sense out of your uh, circumstances, and, you, and you're searching all over, and sometimes we turn to a song, sometimes we'll open up a book, and uh, we try to allow those words to kind of just fall over us so that we can get a sense of peace. Um, sometimes those habits could be a little bit more destructive and we find ourselves engaged in relationships or activities that in the moment they're enough to self-medicate, but after a while they begin to cause our lives to become that much more unhinged. And you begin to see how that phrase all over the place, and instead of bringing peace, you just introduced your life to that much more turmoil. But not so with the wisdom of God. The wisdom of God very often says, look, I'm going to come and I'm going to walk with you in these deep waters. But I can tell you, you hold my hand, and though you walk through the valley of the shadow of death, I will be with you. And he says, mercy and goodness will follow you all the days of your life. Because God has a way of bringing joy even in the midst of trying circumstances. 
because he gives us a knowledge about who he is and what he does. And that knowledge, if we take it seriously, is like a very firm foundation upon which we build our life. You know, I, I have this uh, hobby. I, 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 I like working with stone. Um, I, uh, I built uh, a number of uh, projects around our house, you know, from patios to retaining walls and stuff. And this past uh, weekend, I went out and I tackled my front steps. I just took out all this rotten wood, and um, I had to dig this big trench, you know, so I can build this rock, you know, uh, these rock steps with some blue stone on the top. I'll give you my number if you guys need any side jobs, you know. <laughs> but um, every time I'm digging in the ground, I realize why they call this the granite state. <laughs> and, uh, but you have to put down a, a, a pretty deep, you know, uh, footing, so it takes the water away and all that, and so when it rains and, uh, and it gets cold and it freezes, it's not going to buckle up everything that I just put down. So you need a very good foundation. And whenever I'm engaged in work like that, it, it just reminds me again about the, this wisdom of God. It, it provides this kind of sure footing. It's a great foundation on which to build your life. Because the wisdom of God comes in so many different stripes that it begins to speak into you on numerous levels. I mean, um, from, I mean, just think about it for a moment. You, everyday life, let's say if you're a married person and you might have that rare opportunity to get into a disagreement, right? If the Word of God is really a part of your life, then you begin to think about passages where it says that a husband ought to love his wife as Christ loved the church. He gives himself up for her. Now, in that moment, that may be the furthest thing that you want to do. But the wisdom of God, it begins to speak into your life, and maybe it'll soften your heart. Or the Scripture that comes to mind, it says, look, be angry, but don't sin. Don't let the sun go down on your anger. Don't give the devil a foothold. See, that's a practical way in which I take this Word of God and I begin to pour it into my life, and, and I realize it says I could be angry, but it just says I can't sin. It begins to build some boundaries around me, and, and suddenly now I feel like if I take this Word and I build my life on it, I trust it, then there is this peace that passes all understanding that He promises. There is this awakening that happens and it causes us to be that much more secure. You go through a hard time, in a short time we're going to be going through a passage in, in Corinthians where it says, um, no trial has overcome you except that which is common to man. And God is faithful. He will not allow you to be tried beyond what you're able to bear. But with every trial, he'll provide a way of escape. Sometimes when you're going through that, it doesn't feel that way. But for many of you who have gone through those kinds of waters and then you look back, you realize that God really is one who keeps His Word. It may have been very, very difficult. You may have never thought that you could really get through it, but you do. And then you look back and you realize how God in His grace and His mercy has met you on numerous levels to make that journey that much more, you know, negotiable. So to me, the wisdom of God then, it is superior to all the wisdom of the world because all the things that I'm sharing with you have come to us from God and have been made that much more applicable to our life because of the work that Jesus Christ did on the cross. The cross reconciled us with God. It forgave us of sin. It gives us a life beyond this one provides a spirit that leads us and guides us into all truth. I don't care what fancy poem or, you know, pop-sounding song there might be, but at the end of the day, you really don't want God to leave you alone. 
You want him to speak into your life to make you a better man, to make you a better woman, so that your life then begins to be ordered in a way that brings his pleasure and his blessing. And that's a little bit about what I want to talk to you about today. I want to, I want to talk to you from 1 Corinthians chapter 2, where Paul begins to take another look at how we can lay hold of God's wisdom. And that's the question I want to bring before us. If God's wisdom, as we said, is far superior to the wisdom of this world, then um, what I want you to recognize is today, and I hope you leave today, learning how to really lay hold of that wisdom so you can make it your own. So I'd like you to turn in your Bibles to 1 Corinthians chapter 2, and uh, we're going to look at verses 6 through 16. 1 Corinthians uh, chapter 2, verses 6 through 16. And as everyone's looking, uh, passage in your Bibles on the screens are the numbers. And I'd just like to, I just jumped right into my sermon this morning and forgot to say good morning to all my friends out there in Raymond and those of you who are watching online. Okay, 1 Corinthians chapter 2, verse 6. It says, We do, however, speak a message of wisdom among the mature, but not the wisdom of this age or of the rulers of this age who are coming to nothing. No, we speak of God's secret wisdom, a wisdom that has been hidden and that God destined for our glory before time began. None of the rulers of this age understood it, for if they had, they would not have crucified the Lord of glory. However, as it is written, no eye has seen, no ear has heard, no mind has conceived what God has prepared for those who love him. But God has revealed it to us by his Spirit. For the Spirit searches all things, even the deep things of God. For who among men knows the thoughts of a man except the man's spirit within him? In the same way, no one knows the thoughts of God except the Spirit of God. And we have not received the Spirit of the world, but the Spirit who is from God, that we may understand what God has freely given us. And this is what we speak, not in words taught us by human wisdom, but in words taught by the Spirit, expressing spiritual truths in spiritual words. Let's take a, just a look at that for a moment. There in uh, verse 9, it says, However, as it is written, no eye has seen, no ear has heard, no mind has conceived what God has prepared for those who love him. But God has revealed it to us by his Spirit. If we're going to lay hold of God's wisdom, it's going to be through the Spirit of God, because the Spirit is the revealer of the mind of God. The Spirit is the revealer of the mind of God. You see, that's why earlier in this text, he says, look, we speak a message of wisdom among the mature, but not the wisdom of this age or of the rulers of this age who are coming to nothing. It's like we just said, right? God's wisdom is so far superior to the wisdom of the world. He says, we speak wisdom, but it's not the way the world brings it. Because it's not just a matter of words, it's a matter of substance. And if my words are true, they bring power. They bring transformation. They have the capacity to give us a new heart, to cleanse us from sin, to give us a clean conscience. Sometimes we're looking for those things in all the wrong places. But it says here, it says, no, we speak God's secret wisdom, a wisdom that has been hidden, but God has destined for our own glory before time began. And he says, and none of the rulers understood that, because if they did understand it, then why would they kill the very Son of God who was the radiance of God's glory and the exact representation of his being? If they knew what they had in Jesus, they never would have crucified him, but they didn't. And this is the reason. Because no mind, no, no, he says here, no eye has seen, no ear has heard, neither has it entered into the mind of man all the things that God has, has uh, prepared for those who love him. And then he says, but God has revealed it to us by his spirit. When I ask people, sometimes they're in conversation, look at this text, it says, no eye has seen, no ear has heard, neither has it entered into the mind of man all that God has prepared for those who love him. I said, what do you think he's talking about there? 
And probably eight times out of ten, people will respond to me, he's talking about heaven. And I'm like, actually, when you read through this whole text, what seems to be the overarching theme here? Isn't it wisdom? So it's the wisdom of God that no eye has seen, no ear has heard, neither has it entered into the mind of man, all that God has prepared for those who love him. So here is this wisdom of God that is in the mind of God, but there doesn't seem to be a vehicle for that wisdom to be transferred from him to us. It doesn't seem that by your own faculties, you're gonna figure it out by yourself. That's why the wisdom of this world, no matter how, you know, ear-catching it may be, no matter how it may please our own sense of well-being, at the end of the day, the true wisdom of God is not going to be sought by someone who just searches it out on their own. Because unless God reveals that wisdom, we're at a loss to find it. And now you begin to understand something here. If you want to lay hold of God's wisdom, the only way to do that is by laying hold of the Spirit of God. Because the Spirit is the one who is going to be this revealer of God's wisdom. There's another point that I want to make, though. How are we going to lay hold of God's wisdom? Well, by through the Spirit, because He's the revealer. But the Spirit is also the illuminator of God's wisdom. He's the one that turns on that light bulb in our heads so that there are days when you look at this text and you read it and you're like, oh, I've never seen that before. Notice what he says here. He says, the Spirit searches all things, even the deep things of God. For who among men knows the thoughts of a man except the man's spirit within him? In the same way, no one knows the thoughts of God except the Spirit of God. You know, it's just like here. We're in this, we're in this room together, sitting side by side. You could be sitting along someone that you love deeply. There might be some things that you can, if you've known them for a long time, you, you could tell if they're annoyed or uncomfortable. You could tell if they're preoccupied or happy. I mean, body language is something that we could all look at and you're like, you know, you've been around people for a long time. You know, it just takes my wife and I a second when the kids walk in the house to know if something is up or not, right? But no matter how intimate that knowledge is, do you ever really know what's going on inside that brain of that person next to you? I mean, sometimes you wish you could, right? I remember an old uh, movie, it was called Brainstorm. And uh, this guy made a machine that you put it on, and it actually recorded not only your thoughts, but your emotions. And in the movie, there was this uh, couple that was having a fight, and they just, they were speaking at each other, not to each other. And this guy put on this machine, and it really recorded how we really felt. And he left a note for his wife, and his wife came home, and she put it on, and the scene, All it did was just show her sitting there listening, and then all of a sudden you just see the tears just come down her face because she got it. See, what this Bible is telling us is that the only way that you're really going to know God's mind is if God reveals it. And God says he has revealed it by his Spirit a spirit that he gave as a gift to every single person who embraces his son, Jesus. Jesus says he died and rose again so that he can give this gift of the spirit to his followers. And so in this text, it says here in verse 12, it says, we have not received the spirit of the world, but the spirit who is from God so that we may freely understand what God has given to us. You see, the Spirit then is God's way of saying, let me, let me, uh, let me allow you to, 
to know my mind. Let, let me open this up so you know how I think, how I'm acting. Because I'm not against you, I'm for you. My desire to, for you is for you to just bear the fruit of my spirit, which is love and joy and peace, patience, gentleness, goodness, faithfulness, kindness, self-control. See, it's everything that the world wants to promise you with a song and a dance or a nice book. And, and yet the Bible is pretty clear here. It's saying, like, the only way that you're really going to know it is if my spirit reveals it and if you allow my spirit to illumine your mind. And that's why here in verse 12, you haven't received the spirit of the world, but you've received the spirit that is from God so that you might understand what God has freely given to you. So how do we, how do we receive this spirit? Well, the Bible's been pretty clear, hasn't it? It says that to as many as received my son, to them I gave the right to become the children of God. And as children of God, he says, I take my spirit and I pour it into you so that my spirit bears witness to your spirit that you're a child of God. And how does that happen? It, it just, you come to a place in your life where you realize, I'm a sinner, and my sin has separated me from God, and so it starts off with, I'm sorry. <laughs> and God says, he demonstrates his love for me in that while we were yet a sinner, he died for me. So I say, thank you. That's all it takes. But it doesn't happen when you live your life with this mantra of just, I have a right to be wrong, so just leave me alone. God doesn't want to leave you alone. He wants to speak into your life so that all that he has prepared for you, you would know. You know, the text says that he wants us to understand what he has freely given to us. I started to ask myself that own question, what have we been freely given? And I thought I'd just put a couple of these things up on the screen for you. One of the things that we've been freely given is a measure of God's grace that promises forgiveness. There's a text in 1 John chapter 1, verse 9. If you're a note-taker, why don't you write this down? This is a good text to remind yourself on numerous occasions. It says here, if we confess our sins, he is faithful and just and will forgive us our sins and purify us from all unrighteousness. Have you ever felt guilty? Have you ever felt shame? What do you do with that? You can turn to the world, and the world can say, hey, you know, um, you um, engage in some activity, uh, pay this forward, and, and uh, it'll help with this sense of shame and guilt. But here is the wisdom of God speaking. And it says, if you confess your sins, and that word confession, it, it's, a, it's a compound Greek word that just means to say the same word that God says. So I'm not trying to justify my behavior. If God calls something sin, I recognize it for what it is, and I confess it to him. And notice what he says. He says, I'm faithful and I am just, and I will forgive you of your sins, and I will cleanse you from all unrighteousness. You take a verse like that to a troubled heart and to change, well, it's just powerful. And here's the thing, it's something that God gives to you free. Here's another free one. It talks about life. 
in John chapter 17, verse 3. Why don't you read this out loud with me, okay? Now this is eternal life, that they may know you, the only true God, and Jesus Christ, whom you have sent. I want you to look at this text, and here's Jesus speaking to his Father. This is on the eve of his crucifixion. He's speaking to the Father, and he says, Father, glorify me with the glory that I had with you before the world began. And then he says how the Father has granted the Son life, and that life he gives to all those who embrace him. And then he gives you a definition of what this eternal life is. And if you notice this definition, this definition has nothing to do, I mean, it has something to do with, but it doesn't begin when you're dead. Eternal life isn't the life that comes after this life. This text says that eternal life begins with the knowledge of the Son of God. So that means that I am enjoying eternal life now as a result of understanding who Jesus is, his mission, because the words of God, it says, heaven and earth will pass away, but my word will stand forever. That word is going to be the same word in the kingdom that is yet to come. So it begins now. Your eternal life now as a result of embracing Jesus. And it's free. And you understand that because the Spirit of God, it begins to illumine your mind. And in the brokenness of your own heart, if you've ever confessed your sins to God and heard him say, you're forgiven, it's an awesome feeling. If sometimes you wonder about life and where it's headed, and then you read a text like this and realize that I am participating in that life that is to come now. I, I, I think that's awesome. There's another one, too. It has to deal with our own calling. Later on in this uh, book, we're going to come to a passage in, uh, in chapter 15. And at the end of that passage, it says, it says this in uh, 1 Corinthians 15, 55. It says, where, O death, is your victory? Where, O death, is your sting? The sting of death is sin, and the power of sin is in the law. But thanks be to God. He gives us the victory through our Lord Jesus Christ. And then listen to this line. He says, therefore, dear brothers, stand firm. Let nothing move you. Always give yourself fully to the work of the Lord because you know that your labor in the Lord is not in vain. That you know your labor in the Lord is not in vain. You know why I think this is worthy of mentioning is because what this text is teaching is that a result, as a result of the resurrection of Jesus Christ from the dead, he has empowered all of us to fulfill a call on our life. Have you ever felt that sometimes living this godly life, you think to yourself, I'm playing by some foreign rules here because everybody else doesn't seem to be playing by these same rules. They can do whatever they feel like. It. This, this isn't getting me anywhere. God's saying, no, 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 no. <laughs> Let me tell you this. Your labor for the Lord is not in vain. So that means your work has value. The things that we do now in this life, it matters. As believers, we can't become so heavenly minded that we're no earthly good. No, no, see, we're so heavenly minded that we are the best that the world has. We're the salt of the earth. We're the light of the world. God is putting all of his chips on the body of Christ to manifest to the world what it means to love him with all of its heart, mind, soul, and strength. And this body of Christ goes out and it demonstrates love to the least deserving. It partners alongside those who are disenfranchised. It's not looking to point a finger at people. It's a love of God that motivates us and moves us because we want people to receive the wisdom of God in their life. Because it's a game changer. That's why we're not going to leave you alone. Yeah, you have a right to be wrong, 
But Jesus has given us a privilege to be saved. One more thing I want you to realize here. The Spirit of God is a revealer. The Spirit of God is an illuminator. And the Spirit of God is the inspirator. He's ensuring the fidelity of this message. It's the one thing that I hold on to tenaciously, that in the foolishness of preaching, God says he will save some. That's why in verse 13 of this text, notice what it says. It says, this is what we speak, not in words taught us by human wisdom, but in words taught by the Spirit, expressing spiritual truths in spiritual words. Doesn't that jive with the rest of the Bible? Maybe you memorize this text in 2 Timothy chapter 3 and verse 16, where it says, all Scripture is God-breathed, and is useful for teaching, rebuking, correcting, and training in righteousness so that the man of God may be thoroughly equipped for every good work. These words are God-breathed, and this is what it can accomplish in a person's life. And these are the words that God has spoke, and now faithful believers take that word and they begin to share it with others, and the Spirit of God takes those words, and it begins a transformation in a person's heart and in their mind. Because that Word of God can do all of those things. The world can do it. God says He could do it. Listen to this text in Galatians chapter 1. Verse 11, this is the Apostle Paul speaking. He says, I want you to know, brothers, that the gospel I preached is not something that man made up. I did not receive it from any man, nor was I taught it. Rather, I received it by revelation from Jesus Christ. For you have heard of my former way of life in Judaism and how intensely I persecuted the church of God and tried to destroy it. How do you go from a person intent on that type of violence, so bent in their own actions, that all of a sudden now they become the very one who is laying his his life down for this church rather than destroying it. It's because this wisdom of God has gotten a hold of his heart and it changed him from the inside out. And now he goes out into the world showing them the love of God and it draws them in. You see, the Spirit of God reveals the wisdom of God It illumines our minds so that we can understand the things of God. And it has inspired the very writers of this book so our confidence can be in a God who has brought us into his own mind. That's why in conclusion here, you look at this text in verse 14, and it says, the man without the Spirit does not accept the things that come from this Spirit of God for their foolishness to him, for he cannot understand them because they are spiritually discerned. That's why you could try to convince somebody until you're blue in the face, but unless they open their their minds and their hearts to the influence of the Spirit of God, unless they place themselves in a position of being taught by the Spirit, then everything that we've said today to them The text says foolishness. The Greek word is where you get our English word moronic. To them, it just appears moronic. But notice what it says in verse 15. The spiritual man makes judgments about all things. But he is not subject to any man's judgment. For who has known the mind of the Lord that we may instruct him? but we have the mind of Christ. See, that's the difference. That's why it's so important for us to receive Christ into your life because with him comes the Spirit of God that reveals, illumines, and inspires. Because all the work is God's. It's not about us. It's not about the fancy preacher It's not about the big edifice. It really is all about the Spirit and the work that He is accomplishing 
in the lives of those who hear him. The Spirit reveals, illumines, and inspires. And he's been doing that for generation after generation. Maybe it's time that we just sing, thanks be to God. Amen? Let's pray. Father, we thank you so much for this gift that you have given. Thank you, Lord, for providing for us in ways that have gone beyond our comprehension. For a spirit that illumines our minds so that we might know you more deeply. May this change that occurs in us change our actions so that we go out into the world and become a great witness for you. And we'll be careful to give you all the praise in Jesus' name. Amen.